Okay, who has, who's familiar with the 123D suite of apps from Autodesk? Anyone else? Yeah? Uh, Autodesk has been around for as long as I have, I think. They made AutoCAD in the beginning, and now they make all kinds of cool stuff. But they're very expensive. And a few years ago, they came out with a new suite of stuff that's free for everybody. And it's, some of it is one of a kind, and it's all pretty good stuff. One of them that they have is, um, I'll just go to the website. Uh, but we're using, we're going to use one of their applications here. They're all in the cloud, so all you need is a browser. Chromebooks work great for it, even a Pi if you have a good browser. And a lot of these we covered for our 3D modeling meeting, which you went to. I don't think Alex was there. Where is Alex? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, here are some of the apps that they have there. 123D Catch will make 3D models from photographs with your tablet. Uh, 123D Design is a 3D modeler you can use with the mouse. 123D Make would be useful for uh, <clears throat> if you had a, a laser cutter or a paper cutter. You can make 3D objects out of 2D layers. Uh, 123D Sculpt is for drawing freehand with a, an iPad and Tinkercad. Is my favorite 3D modeler ever. Today we're going to use 123D Circuits, which is different instead of dealing with 3D models at all. Uh, <clears throat> this allows us to model and simulate electronic circuits. And it's relatively unique because it has this incredible feature that it supports um, Arduino. And I need my... Who doesn't use a password safe? You're doing it wrong. Use a password safe. 500 million logins were leaked from Yahoo by a rootkit type application that the federal government forced them to install and it got hacked. You gotta have crazy passwords and the only way to keep track of them is with one of these. So I'll go in here, and y'all can see it if you want, because that's it. It's garbage, as it should be. And you could have taken a photo of it, you still won't remember it. And that's the kind of passwords we should all be using. We don't live in a world where we can't do that anymore. This is, unfortunately, probably their slowest application. does great things, but it, it's a bit of a dog, no matter what kind of connection you have. You said you got g good results with the Brave browser. I'm doing okay with Chrome. He, he does okay with Edge. Am I just a... Let me know if I cover that up again. Um, <clears throat> trying to decide what to show you first. But uh, why don't we? What's that? We could do that. So, who who doesn't know what a breadboard is? Everyone does. I had a bunch of them here. This is a standard breadboard and it allows you to plug wires into it and components into it and connect things up so that you can prototype your circuits. Uh, I like these little ones for my presentations here because I can make up a little circuit and have, I just kind of I have 10 of them and I can just kind of leave it. And if I need to work with something else, I just jump wires to another breadboard. Uh, it can be kind of a pain to work that way in general, but for my presentations, I'm gonna use these little ones. They're, they work the same way. <coughs> All of these little holes are arranged in such a way that these, these vertical lines are all connected and all of these vertical lines are connected. There's a gap here where you would put some types of uh, components and down here, these are all connected in this line the other direction 
Same thing up top. So they're for making physical circuits and they make it very easy. So that's what you see on this screen. Um, actually, Blinky isn't working. It's not wired up. So I could edit it. I don't want to take a lot of time doing it, but I'll, I'll do it anyway because uh, I want everybody to see the process that I went through to build this. So here's an Arduino. And the Arduino is itself a computer. It's not a desktop computer like ours, like we use every day. A Raspberry Pi is more like that. But it takes instructions. We write programs, stuff them in there, and it executes them. It has its own memory, its own memory controller, its own CPU. It is a computer. And it's all on this little chip. This is a 328P. Different Arduinos have different chips. This one's probably the most popular. But if I click on that and click on the code editor, here's the code that comes on the Arduino when you buy it. And it's really simple. All it does is it turns on and off an LED that's right here on the board. And actually, it probably would work just like that, wouldn't it? So I can click Start Simulation. Go like this. There it is. I don't know if you can see it, but that, that LED is blinking right there. And that's tied to pin 13. If I wanted to, I could put on an external LED and flash that too. But it actually runs the code that we put in it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even, I don't think I even wrote this one. This, this just comes up when you add an Arduino Uno to your project. That code is in it. But I can modify it, click upload and run, and it will change the program. If I wanted to add an external uh, LED, I would click on components and pick one of the categories here. This one's easy because I need a resistor, always. And it's oriented the wrong way. And I need an LED. The long lead is positive. They're picky. So you see that this lead is, I'm going to switch it the other way. This lead is kind of on an angle, but I, it tells me that it's the anode when I hover. And this is the cathode, that's negative. So it's going to connect to everything in this line, and that includes this end of the resistor. The other end of the resistor is here, and that connects here. And I clicked on that dot, and now I'm drawing a line. I'll draw that line to the ground. There are several grounds. They're labeled here, teeny tiny. You can zoom in. And I'll put that other one, I've done it badly, but I'll click on this and put it on the 13 pin, which I can't see. There we go. Well, I'm in the middle of dragging. I don't have a lot of control there. And I think that will do the same thing. There we go. So you can wire things up on this breadboard. You don't have to have the breadboard. These things can just float out up in the middle of nowhere if they want, if you want them to. <clears throat> but if you don't have a lot of components and you want to build something, you can do it virtually now. And it's a pretty darn good tool. Like I said, it's a little doggy, but it does pretty good things. And that's how I built everything that I'm doing here. So let's go to the next one. Uh, the UI is not great here either. I don't even know how to get back to it. Um, I'm going to go to Bluetooth light control, make sure that's the right one. Now let's go over some rules. First off, every LED has no will to live. They're fragile and they're suicidal. If you put a battery on an LED, it will suck up so much current to please itself that it actually blows up. You'll hear a pop, you'll smell it, and it won't ever light up again. It's like teenagers who mouth off to me. They just they can't wait to die. So you have to calculate, using Ohm's law, how many resistors or how much resistance to put on uh, one array or an, an array of, sorry, one LED or an array of LEDs. And the Ohm's Law formula is simple enough that everybody in here could probably do it, but you don't have to. If I go here and say uh, LED Array Calculator, 
You wouldn't believe it, but somebody has already done this. Some of them are really cool. There are hundreds of them. When you buy an LED, the documentation for a program is called documentation. The documentation for an electronics component is called a data sheet. Every component has one available. You can find it online. Make sure your part number is right and you'll have all the specs you need. But in general, an LED takes a forward voltage drop of about two volts. These dinky little cheap ones that I'm using. If you're using high intensity or something, better go to the data sheet. It's going to be different. But I can say that I'm using, what am I using? Uh, I put 9 volts on it. So I'll say my source of voltage is 9 volts. And my forward voltage is 2 volts. Uh, just as standard as 2 volts is about 20 milliamps is about all the current they can take. Some take 30, but if you put in 20 you'll be safer. And the number of LEDs in my array, I'll say 8. And then design my array. And look what it does. It shows me I need four in a series. I need two sets of that. And each one should have a 56 ohm resistor on it. I didn't have to do any math. I didn't have to experiment. I didn't have to blow up any LEDs. So I did the math, and I did better than this. I managed to do it with some that I actually had. I don't have 56 ohm resistors. You can always put on more resistance, and it may dim your LEDs. That's the only consequence. But if you put on less, they can pop. So that's, that's a nice thing to know about. So I've got these arrays of four, and I actually built two circuit boards like that. I'm going to try and switch to the Elmo. I think I had it on there before. So let's see what happens. got to do. Uh, who's worked with these or a Raspberry Pi or a chip or a Beagle board? What's the biggest pain in the neck about working with these? Worst thing? Where to stick it? What's that? Where to stick it? Where to stick it? Tell me more. Uh, where do you want to pull it on so it doesn't fall off? So it doesn't fall off? The trouble with these is the cable is heavier than the card every time. And it wants to fall off the table. It drags your card with it. It drags your electronics everywhere. So can everybody see this? I've got this binder clip. And I clamped that cable to the table. Say that again. Alma, say it. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, get a good grip on it so it doesn't move. And give yourself enough room. Not enough room. Okay, so can everybody see those okay? There's a zoom feature here. Okay, uh, down here, this is a push button. So, in case anybody's wondering. Um, Everything else that I put here uh, are wires, and I've put these on here so that I can take these, uh, any old kind of battery, and I put them on these little terminal blocks and just screw them in, and then I can stick that on any of these boards. And now I've powered, this line is all positive, and this line is all negative, and I know that it's just wired that way, as long as I plug it into the right place, which I didn't. <laughs> Always make sure you do. There. Now, this is, we're going to modify this just a little as we go, but right now, hey, working state. I've made it so I can just push the button and I know that there's juice and there's light and they're talking. So, I'll switch back to this. And it says we're still recording. We can hope. Now, what I've done 
may or may not work here, but in my uh, for my phone, I've written an application, an Android app, and I've done it in uh, <laughs> App Inventor. App Inventor is uh, who's who's used Scratch for programming. App Inventor is like Scratch, but without the cat. It was developed by MIT, and is that right? No, it was developed by Google. And Google said, okay, that was cool, but we don't care, we're gonna dump it. And I had all these programs written in it, and I thought, well, that stinks. But MIT picked it up, and they have a version two. So if I go to, I just Googled it, and I'm here at appinventor.mit.edu, I can click create apps. And then I can go to my key pass. Oh, I don't have to. It knows who I am. That's unexpected. Okay, so this is App Inventor. Uh, <clears throat> I would have gone to start a new project, and I would get a blank designer. And it's just this Android screen. I can come over here and take my components and drag them over. Uh, for example, here's a label. Now, Android developers probably know that Android was mostly friendly for Java developers using the Android SDK. This is not much different as far as layouts go. If you drag components on here, they're just going to go from top to bottom in a row, and they're going to stick on the left. If you want to do something like this where they go side by side, you have to look at a layout and pick a horizontal arrangement and then drop the components in there. You can see the, uh, the relationship tree over here, but there's plenty of time for playing with that. We're all probably developers and we can handle that, right? Uh, if I click on this and hit delete, I can't do it. I have to do it from over here. So there are some quirks to it and that's okay. It all works pretty well. Uh, I can change some of the properties over here, like the text and the name. Uh, I have mostly left all of the names alone, except where I have two buttons. I want to know which ones they are. Uh, labels I haven't renamed, slider I haven't renamed. But what this application will do is I've put on buttons that I want, that, that have functions that I want to perform with a Bluetooth connection to my Arduino. So I'm going to show you how to do that. The uh, select device is just going, is a really a connect button, but it'll ask you which Bluetooth device to connect to. I'm going to try and pair, see if we can even do this. Um, I don't need to do it from here. I can do it without. Uh, there are a couple of different ways that you can run this program, and, I, and I'll do it a different way. Uh, once you're done with your design here, you can click on blocks, and this is, you can zoom in and out, but you can basically see, that's the whole program right there. I dragged blocks, and dragged more blocks and snapped them into the first blocks until I had a working program. So over here, I did some global variables because there are some limits to what the way this can work. Uh, there aren't really a lot of scopes, uh, but a lot of the rest works about the same as you would expect. Here is an event handler for one of the visual controls. I just clicked on over here and picked um, button send, there it is. And in the menu, I get all of his events, easy peasy. I just dragged one over here and went over here and found some actions, drop them in there. This one takes a parameter, so I gave it a parameter, and it's just like a puzzle. Once it's all set up, I can click on connect, and I think I can run AI Companion. And I have to install, oh look, I have a Nunug meeting right now. Thanks for the reminder. I can go to my phone and press the run this app that it's expecting. <sighs> I need Wi-Fi. I don't know why I need Wi-Fi. Oh, 
I thought it would work over 4G. Is Simmons building public? Mm -hmm. Ugh. It's also public. It's also public. Well, I guess I'm on an open network now. Oh, you guys weren't on the projector. You didn't see that. I set it up on the Elmo. You got to tell me when you can't see the screen. Okay, so this MIT AI2, it, I don't know if you can see it okay or not, but it just has some buttons. I'm going to click on the scan QR code and just point it at the screen. And it'll just, I can type those characters in, but this is easier. Then I'll click connect with code. It already knows that it entered it because the screen disappeared. Now here's my app on my phone. I built it here, now it's on my phone. And I can run it here, and I think I could even debug it, but I haven't bothered. I mean, the program is just not that tough. But let's see what we can do with it. I'm going to switch source. Okay, I'm going to power this off the USB. You can't quite see all of that. Okay, I'll put the USB in here and it'll fire this thing up. Because you can power it through USB or you can put uh, power supply on this barrel jack. Uh, this runs 5 volts, all USB does, but it's limited to half an amp. So that's not a lot of juice. It's enough to run LEDs just fine, but if you want something beefy, you better have one of these other circuits going on. Uh, I had some slides that I didn't show, but uh, I'm going to show you how to use these MOSFETs. This is a, uh, a special kind of transistor. Normal transistors are bipolar junction transistors or BG, BJTs. They can do switching, but they don't like to work with different voltages or high voltages or high, high current usually. These ones are the ones you want to use if you're going to be switching between 5 volts here and 12 volts here or 9 volts here. And if you have a big old long strip of these, like you all have a section on one of those, uh, or something like this. This has 300 LEDs on it. It takes 5 amps. You can't power that from this. It needs 10 times that. So let's take some of these jumpers. And power some stuff. I have here a Bluetooth connector. This is an HC06. They run about two and a half bucks. This is an Uno. They run, I think I paid 10 for this. Their retail is 30. The ones you all have in the bag do everything this can do. They have the same microprocessor, microcontroller on them. So there's everything I'm doing here you guys can do with that chip. Now, um, this has a TX and an RX pins over here. That's just a serial connection. All it does is it determines if it's a one or a zero while it's communicating over the serial channel. A one means that there's a high voltage, a zero means that there's a low voltage. So that's the same way that the HC06 communicates. But there's a problem. The HC06 wants 3.3 volts, and these pins do 5 volts. So I have to do something silly, and I use two resistors here to split it in half. It's called a voltage divider. And they're not equal, so they don't split it, exact, they don't split it exactly in half. Uh, one side puts out about 3.4 volts, so this guy won't get worn out or blown or you know minimizes the risk. Uh, I've connected the serial connection to the Arduino, and I'm also going to power it from the Arduino. I could use batteries for this part, but there's no reason to. It doesn't use much, and the Arduino can power it. So I'll put this on the 5 volts, and I'll put this on the ground. So two two wires to power it, and two wires to talk to it. I'm just going to make sure I did everything right. So the, the transmission line going out of the UNO is the one that's sending 5 volts. That's the one I have to divide. The one coming back from here is 3.3. So 
coming back in, I don't have to do anything with it. The Arduino can handle 3.3 volts. So at this point, this light is flashing violently. And as soon as I get my phone out and connect to it, if that works, this is, Bluetooth is finicky. This could take some effort. Usually it works for me, but there were some times while I was working on this where it just did not want to work. So I'm gonna go through the whole process here. And I'm gonna click on this little ellipsis and stop this application. Because I have a feeling it's gonna be a pain. I'm gonna to go to settings. I'm gonna turn off my Bluetooth. Just turn it off. Turn it back on. The HC06 is paired. I'm gonna make it stop doing that. And then I'm going to, if I didn't have to scan, it appeared. I'll just repair. The pin is one, two, three, anyone, anyone? Four, Four. very good. Idiot, put on a suitcase. <laughs> so, it's pairing, and it's paired. Now, I'll go back and rerun the application. No need to switch the display, I'll be real quick. There's, on the, on the menu here, I could click that AI compare, uh, companion again, but it's grayed out. I gotta go down to reset connection, and then I can try this again. It'll come up with a QR code again. I'll show you this time. There's this MI2, or sorry, MIT AI2 companion. I'll just click on that. It wants the code. I'll come over here to get it. I click connect. Am I leaving you enough time, mate? Sure. Better. Okay. Make sure you have a good Wi-Fi. Okay, I'm going to select a device. That's still flashing, good. It's gonna give me a list. You want the HC06, that's my top one. You can rename that when you get into this, but I didn't bother. I want you to see what you're gonna be up against. And the response is that it connected. So I am now talking to this guy. The light is not flashing anymore, it's solid. We are paired, we are talking. Cool? Now, let's hook up our LEDs. Uh, this one. So, bring it down here. The program that's currently in here is going to talk to the LEDs on, it's gonna to talk to the switch. So the output for the switch is going to go to the LEDs on their negative here. Now it's important to note that because this is an N-type switch, N-type MOSFET, which is the only kind I'll probably ever need to use, uh, and that's the type you probably want, I need to have the power of the battery going to the positive on my load, and then the negative of the load should go to the switch. So I'm switching the ground on and off, not the positive. And we'll see if I did that right or not. I want to show you this box is running 4.5 volts and the other one is running 12, or sorry, 9. Okay, so they're connected properly. If I push this button, it does the same thing as this button. Now I want to replace that button with my Arduino. Yes? I can do that here. Ideally. I'm still crossing my fingers, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I want uh, pin 9 on the Arduino because that's the one I told it to use. They're labeled here and pin 9 has a little squiggle next to it, which means that it can output a PWM signal. We use a PWM signal to fade an LED. 
Now I'm going to put that in the place where I used to have this green. I can actually have them both there if I have enough room. Early. Okay, and then I need a ground. Everything should have the same ground, all of them connected together. One big hippie commune, all grounds together. And if you can, get them to stay. Taking bets, anyone? Uh-oh. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm looking at this one. Are you watching these ones? On, off. You can't see your phone though, the phone. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm doing it with the phone. On, off. <laughs> ah, but wait, there's more. If you order now, we can give you fading. Fading in and fading out. Oh, who's impressed now? <laughs> Darn right. So. Uh, there's a reason that I wanted to do it this way. Uh, first, to show you that there are a lot of accessories uh, that you can plug into your Arduino. This could have been a sensor. You can buy these little PIR sensors. They're the same things you have on your floodlights that detect cars and people. You can buy those for a few bucks, two or three. And that could be your sensor instead of a communication with the phone. The phone is awesomer, and I didn't have PIR sensors, so you're welcome. But uh, there are hundreds of sensors you can buy. Uh, some of those stomping foot pads you see at the Halloween store, they all work great. Uh, and they're all really easy to use. The Arduino can be controlled, can, can be programmed to do anything you want. Uh, we computer programmers already appreciate the, the potential of that. Uh, I'm using 10% of this program's, of this uh, device's memory to store that program. And a lot of that is built in stuff like the serial library that I'm using. My particular program is a fraction of it, so you can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, I wanted to show that even though I'm running this off 4.5 volts, this is 5 volts. These could have been the same power supply. Uh, if I didn't have the USB plug in here, I might power both of them with a 5 volt supply. But I can't drive a whole ton of LEDs with 5 volts. Those strips over there, they require 12, or they won't even light. Uh, they run out of volts before they get from the beginning to the end. Um, with these, in fact, if I put if I put this supply on, this is four and a half volts. This is why I do computers instead of electronics. I hate cables. I might break these ones off, but. They don't even light. They're on now, but they don't light. The button would light them too. They just don't. There aren't enough volts in here. If I have four in a row and they take two each, that's eight volts. I'm only giving it four and a half. They will not light. They need more voltage. Motors need more voltage. Pneumatics might if you have a 12 volt solenoid. You need to be able to use these MOSFETs to control, uh, oh good, I thought it was hot, uh, to control uh, current, the control devices that consume a lot of current or amperage or require a lot of voltage. Uh, nothing I'm going to do with these is going to be over 12 volts. Um, the only thing I can think of that would do that would be motors, big electric motors. And in that case, you may just want to use a relay and an AC motor, but not for lighting. Now, the last thing to note is this, um, this is a MOSFET, which is a field effect transistor. The, that's what the FET part stands for. It's just like the little teeny ones that come in those little black cans, but uh, it comes in a different, what's called package. The actual physical shape of it is a TO220. The other ones are a TO92. The reason that they make them this way is so that you can take a heat sink and screw it onto the back. Because when these things are doing their job, they're, they're dealing with a lot of energy. And they may deal with it in either direction. And if they, uh, if, if, they're, if you put a lot of demand on them, they'll, trans, they'll, they'll convert electricity into thermal energy or heat. And so when they do that, they get hot. So if you'll want to put some kind of heat sink, this is an ugly, stupid looking one, but it's the one that I brought. 
Uh, this actually came out of a computer power supply like this. So it's, it's a big beefy one and it's got two screws and you would just take that hole, put the screw through it and clamp this thing to the back of it and then all of the heat would go into the heat sink and if it has enough surface area it can dissipate the heat into the air so it won't get too hot and that's how you would manage that. So that's why they're shaped that way. Uh, I need to get out of here so that he can get started. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, this board? Your, if, you've, if, if you've got 3.5 or, or thereabouts, 3.3 volt, yeah, you can power, you can power this, um, but no, no, you can't. When I started, uh, the, the this Bluetooth? Yeah, um, you can't actually, now that I think about it. When I first started, I actually said, Dan, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? I was running it on 3.3 volts. For the power and it needs more. On the back it says 3.6 to 6 volts so I was giving it 3.4 it wasn't or 3.3 and it wasn't enough. So I have to run the power leads for well, 5 volts and just this one TR lead has to be 3.3. But yeah you have to run this guy off of 5 volts. Okay. So that actually kind of made it easier once I got it. Sorry? Did you say we're about Okay so this is this was uh, two and a half bucks on Amazon. I don't know if that's what I paid, but that's what it was this week when I looked. Uh, these, the nanos that you have, they're two and a half bucks. This, you should be able to get for 45 cents at jamico.com, jamco. Uh, these are 39 cents. The resistors are pennies. The LEDs are pennies. The breadboards, I forget, a few bucks. Um, you may not use a battery box, but on the whole here, I think I have under 10 bucks worth of stuff doing this. And if I wanted to do something super heavy like these LEDs, which I thought I might like to show, but we're too short on time, um, I think these were 11 bucks a piece. And they're pretty beefy. You can light up your whole front in front of your house with that. So on the invitation that said, out Halloween your neighbor Griswold style, I'm talking about those. And so 10 bucks here and 10 bucks there for 20 bucks, you've got a heck of a setup. So it's all pretty inexpensive. Anything else? Dan, you're up. <laughs>